Joining me right now is Dr. Josh Dines. He's the orthopedic surgeon specializing at the Sports Board Sports Medicine at the Hospital for Special Surgery. He works with the New York Mets and the New York Rangers. Dr. Dines, how are you doing on this Friday? Great. Thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate you coming on. So, you know, in our area, a lot of people have a lot of questions about the recovery, first of all, of Carson Wentz. And, you know, historically, you know, you look at the history of tearing an ACL and an LCL. Typically, that's a, a 9 to 12 month recovery. But this is a guy who seems to be recovering a lot faster than we ever expected. I know years ago, a guy like Adrian Peterson tears up his knee. He came back in record time. I know medicine has advanced, but has it really advanced that much that a guy like Carson Wentz could recover so quickly? Or is this an issue of possibly he just is a quick healer? Like, how do you look at a situation like that? Well, you know, it's a great question. And, and like to classify, you know, themselves as quick healers. Um, and, and like anything else, you know, probably some people do heal a little more quickly. But I think the real issue is, um, you know, there's, there's nothing. We, our medical techniques have gotten better. Our surgical reconstruction techniques have gotten better. Uh, our, our understanding of the rehab process, which is, is equally as important, has gotten better and more scientific. So I think all these things have factored in. The one issue, though, is, you know, the good news for Carson Wentz is that, you know, if you tear your ACL and your LCL, it's clearly a more severe injury, uh, and it was more trauma to cause those tears. But once you're kind of repairing something, in this case, the ACL, the ACL, that's really what dictates the amount of time for recovery. So long term, he may have, you know, more issues than somebody who had an isolated ACL tear. But the recovery time doesn't typically change. So and that's it's really about nine to 12 months for an ACL, as you alluded to. And he's getting on that now. So uh, maybe he's a quick healer. These guys are the best athletes in the world. Their college is different. They're, you know, they're, they're something about them is clearly different that enables them to be such good athletes. But at the end of the day, his time frame is, is pretty appropriate and what we'd expect. The one thing that we can't speed up, which is our goal of the, of the next decade, is the biology on the inside. So while Carson Wentz might say he feels great now because his muscle strength is great, his range of motion is great, and, and obviously I haven't examined him. This is just based on hearsay. But while those things may be true, the one thing we can't speed up is the, the fact that the body is making that tendon into a new ligament on the inside of the knee. And that's why you still have to protect them even though the athletes say they're ready, we, we, we as doctors try to slow them down a little because I think we have a better understanding of the biology on the inside. So how does that conversation go? When you have an athlete who says, I feel doc, I feel great. I feel like I could do this. I can do that. You know, how do those conversations go where you're trying to, you know, help the athlete be a little bit more realistic about their recovery, especially for a guy who, you know, some of these athletes, this is the first time they're ever having these injuries. They don't have a history with a torn ACL or a shoulder or wherever it may be. Right. No, it's, it's a huge issue because it's scary because this is their career. You know, their career is trying to get that. So these to be career-ending injuries. So that would be scary for any of us. Um, so it's really about communication, and it starts well before the injury. You know, you're, you, a lot of times, you know, you, you're not meeting these guys for the first time when they have a, a big injury like an ACL tear. You're seeing them every day during training camp when they have little things going on and, and in the training room. Uh, but it's about, it, like anything else, establishing a rapport, establishing trust, and can, uh, friendship might be the wrong word, but, you know, a relationship so that when something more serious like an ACL tear does occur happens, um, you know, they've got your, you've got their credibility and they, they trust you already. And then it's about, but then it's a different discussion, which is, you know, they say they're ready to play and you say they're not. Um, and, and you have to, again, let them know that you're on their side. This is not about the team. At the end of the day, you know, we, we're team doctors, but first and foremost, it's about the patient. You know, they're, they're, they're patients, and that's kind of taken out of the context of the team, and you want to do what's most safe and, and predictable for them. And it's really getting them to buy into that. And you say, look, you might feel great, but, but we've seen this happen before. You got, you know, you're strong, you're in good shape. If anybody's going to feel good, you're going to, but you're still at an increased risk for injury. So you don't want to be, you know, penny rich and dollar poor where you're too soon, but at the same time you're risking a more severe injury. So it's really about communication, patient education, and establishing a relationship. Dr. Josh Dines joining us on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline here on 97.3 ESPN. You can follow him on Twitter at Josh Dines MD. Dr. Dines, you know, you look at a guy like Carson Wentz, he's also wearing that heavy, heavy knee brace. And to me, it's a huge contrast between him and Deshaun Watson. While Wentz tore his ACL and LCL, Watson only tore his ACL, but he's running around without a brace at all on his knee while Wentz is with the brace. So kind of what is the timetable? Like, what is the progression 
when it comes to an athlete recovering from those kind of injuries who are football players, because obviously football is a little bit of a different sport. You know, it's a contact sport, whereas like a baseball is not a contact sport. So kind of what is the progression usually when it comes to the braces, when it comes to when they get the brace off? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a, a part of it is kind of the doctors prescribing it, and part of it is the athlete. Again, it's about education and, and convincing them that it's important. But at the end of the day, you know, these are these are adults, and they're going to make their own decisions. Um, you'd like to think that they're going to listen to the recommendations the doctors make. Uh, and, and typically, look, you know, I try to be on the side of being conservative, and you'd much rather have somebody begging to come out of the brace, uh, you know, because they've been in too long than, than the reverse, where they're out of it too soon, and then they subject themselves to further injury. But I think it gets back to what we talked about earlier, which is we're not comparing apples and apples when you're comparing somebody with an isolated ACL tear to somebody with an ACL LCL. So even though the surgery, you know, the recovery time is, is, a, is similar, there may be some, again, I haven't examined Carson, um, there may be some lingering effects uh, on the lateral side that they're trying to protect. Um, and, and the fact that it was a more severe injury, they're probably erring on the side of being more conservative, which which I would not disagree with at all. Dr. Then, Dines, yeah, if I could just jump in. So a guy like Deshaun Watson, when you see someone like him not even wearing a knee brace and he's less than a year from tearing his ACL, you know, you know, what What is your eyes telling you when a guy is out there without a knee brace being as mobile as they were before? Is that just a guy who had a great recovery, a great healing? Or is that potentially also that maybe that the, the tear or the surgery was not as complicated as previously thought? Uh, it, it could be either of those. Or honestly, you know, my, as I alluded to, my bias would be to be more conservative. So we typically keep people in a brace, you know, for the first season after an ACL reconstruction. Um, so... Again, some doctors are more aggressive, some more conservative. It might be a case of the athlete just not listening and saying that it hinders them too much and they're willing to take the risks of not playing with one. Um, so I don't think you can read too much into it. Again, it, it may just be you know patient noncompliance or the other things that you that you raised. You know, obviously the doctors are involved, and in, I don't think, especially when you talk about the Texans and professional teams, they'd be letting somebody play without a brace if they still needed it. But again, my bias is to be conservative. You want to prevent further injury because if it happens again. That's really where you start worrying about the end of one's career. So nine months without a brace, honestly, is a little on the early side and a little aggressive side in general. But, but you're right. I mean, we don't know. When you talk about an ACL tear, they're not all the same. Um, the surgeries are not all the same. So unless you're the actual operative surgeon or you've seen the operative report, it's really speculation as to what was done in there and, and whether a brace is necessary or not. Dr. Dines, also in our backyard, we have Zaire Smith, the Sixers rookie. He just had surgery today for the Jones fracture in his foot. Explain to the audience a little bit about what a Jones, fra Jones fracture is, how it usually can happen, and also touch on maybe you know why this seems to happen to basketball players more than other sports. Uh, good question. So a Jones fracture is kind of the, the, the term for a, a fifth metatarsal fracture, which is kind of the you know, the bone on the outside of your foot um, towards your pinky toe. And it, it takes a ton of the stress when you land and when you're pushing off. Uh, there's three different areas where that bone is typically fractured. The reason why a Jones fracture is important is because in, when you're talking about a Jones fracture, that's the area where that bone does not have great blood supply, which is probably why these fractures happen in the first place to a certain extent, but also why, as, as you alluded to today, surgery is often necessary to get it to heal. It's, they, you know, they, they occur one of two ways. Sometimes it's just sort of bad luck. You land on it the wrong way. These are big athletes we're talking about, especially basketball players and football players. Uh, you land on it with a ton of stress and the bone just gives out. Or it's just repetitive, you know, just from years of jumping and landing. And then obviously the combination of both. Sometimes it's repetitive landing on it and then just sort of bad luck. You land on it the wrong way one time and the bone breaks. As I mentioned, because there's not great blood supply to that area, we've gotten more aggressive about fixing them because we know if they don't get fixed, there's a very high chance that that bone doesn't heal, and then you end up needing a surgery down the road, so now you've really drawn out the recovery time. So when it comes, you mentioned about landing on it. So for basketball players, we know there's a lot of jumping, a lot of landing. Obviously, that's why some guys have some of the injuries they do. But do you also think that because we don't see this in baseball or football or even hockey, where I would think there might be more Jones fractures just because of how much they lean on the side of their foot with skating, you know, is there possibly even something genetic about basketball players or is maybe something with the sneakers that could possibly help prevent these? Or are these just injuries that no matter what the prevention or the situation may be, they're just going to happen and you just got to deal with it when they happen? So, I mean, to use your hockey analogy, you know, they, 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 they sometimes get fractures, but it's more direct contact from, you know, from the puck. 
Um, and it's really it's not a it's not an impact or a load bearing sport per se. You're pushing off at the skate, but that's different. Like if you if you jump, you know, or even to give an, a, a more simple example, if you're going up a stair, and you know, that's about seven times your body weight across your kneecap. So these guys are, are huge. You know, they're six five, six ten, seven feet tall, two three hundred pounds. Um, you can imagine each time they jump and land on it, you're getting you know a multiple of your body weight concentrated in a small area of the foot. And I think that's why we're seeing it. Now, we're, again, we see it a lot in, in football players as well, um, and they're equally as big. You know, so I, I don't. Th- I think it's more kind of genetic in the sense that these are just you know really big individuals, really strong, a lot of force. Um, you know, they're jumping up higher, so they're landing you know from a further height, so it becomes kind of the perfect storm. We saw that last a couple of years ago when Ben Simmons had the same injury. It basically took him you know, roughly 8 to 12 months till he was fully better. We saw a few years ago that Kevin Durant, he tried to come back too soon. He actually re-injured himself, and he had to be out even longer. What is typically goes into the recovery and the rehab of, as you mentioned, uh, an injury that doesn't have a lot of blood supply going to it? Yeah, but you hit the nail on the head. You know, the problem is when people try to come back too soon, we know there's a much higher rate of it refracturing. And then... You know, I think you've almost guaranteed yourself more surgery with a longer recovery. So there was a study done on NFL players where this does happen pretty commonly. And the athletes that got back, you know, went back to play before 10 weeks, had a much higher rate of it refracturing, requiring more surgery than those who waited longer than 10 weeks. Um, you really just have to kind of let it rest, keep weight off it, give it the best chance to heal. So it's, you know, with, with that in mind, with that data in mind, it's at least three months of really letting it heal. And then once it heals, only then can you really start, you know, putting significantly more load on it, getting into playing shape for an NBA-type player. So, uh, you know, I think six months is, is probably a, an optimistic you know, or guess as to when they'll be back. Maybe a little sooner, but, but again, you, you don't want to be on the side here where you push these back too quickly because if it goes south, then you're looking at a much longer recovery the second time around. Dr. Josh Dines joining us here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline on 97.3 ESPN you know, we talked a little bit earlier about the communication between the doctor and the patient. Talk about how those conversations go for you and other doctors when it comes to athletes coming to you. Obviously, these guys, they want to be out there. They want to play. And for some of them, there may be a reluctance to tell the doctor, hey, I got this thing bothering me. I got this other issue that I've been dealing with. You know, how do you deal with some of those conversations, especially for guys who they just want to go out there and play? Yeah, I mean, look, as I mentioned earlier, this is their livelihood. It's scary if somebody's, you know, if, if or an injury is kind of threatening to take that away. So it's a really scary situation for them. Um, so as I mentioned before, really it, communication, it sounds cliche, but it's critical um, to establish a good rapport for them to know that, you know, first and foremost, you have their, their interests in mind. Um, you know, they're getting better is what's most important to you, not the team, not the standings, not, not where it is in the season, uh, because only that can you kind of treat them appropriately and, and honestly, and have their, their support and, and, and trust in you. Um, and then it's really, again, about education because, you know, a lot of things we do treat, there's, there's different options, whether it's to try to be conservative or surgery. It's about giving them all the options, giving them the, you know, the risks and benefits of each, the expected recovery times, the expected outcomes of each. And a lot of times it's not just a discussion with them, but with their agent uh, and, and family um, and kind of their support staff to make sure everybody's on the same page and understands all the options that, that you know, because – you really want everybody bought into the decision that's made so that you give it the best chance to work. I know you can't answer this question specifically, but you know, just on the outside looking in, as someone who's worked with Ashley Hughes, you've worked with the Mets, you've worked with the Rangers, you look at the 76ers, they've had a guy get injured almost every year for the last six years. It's Zaire Smith yeah. this year, it's Ben Simmons the year before, it's Joel Embiid the year before that, a couple years before that. You know, it, it, All these guys keep getting injured, and I know it's a frustrating thing for fans you know, as a doctor, you know, you know how, how do you manage the expectations of these guys to kind of let them know, look, everything's going to be all right. These injuries happen. Sometimes things are out of your control. And you have a guy like Embiid, you know, it was his back, and then it was his foot, and then it was his knee. You got a guy like Ben Simmons, you know, he just stepped on a guy's foot, Jones fracture. Zaire Smith was training, Jones fracture. These guys, it's not like these injuries are per se preventable. So how do you deal with a situation in a locker room, in an organization where guys keep coming up with these types of injuries. It's, I mean, it, look, it's bad luck. You know, it's one of those, because they're going to happen. They happen all the time. Um, it just so happens for the Sixers, it's been kind of their first-round pick each time. And I don't think you can do necessarily a better job of screening, 
at the combine when you draft these people because these, a lot of these are just kind of fluke injuries or, or bad luck injuries that are going to happen. And if they happen to somebody who's a second year player, it's not a new story. But when it's the first round pick each year, uh, you know, it's terrible. Look, I can empathize with the Mets. We've had a lot of injuries, and, and a lot of them are just sort of bad luck. Uh, and then, you know, so they, we, we get, you know, the, the press asks all the time, how come the Mets have more injuries? And then you look at other teams uh, who've had an equal amount of injuries, but they're winning, so it doesn't become an issue. You know, if, if you're the Dodgers and you go through a lot of starting pitchers, people don't care because they continue to win. But when, it, when you're not winning, then it becomes an issue. So I think the Sixers had a couple of years where they were not very good. Um, so that becomes, you know, it becomes, it, it's brought to the spotlight. I think the fact that they're now getting better and Philly sports in general is outstanding. These will become less, you know, less of a story and you realize that it's just kind of bad luck and the players will get back and, and they'll keep winning. Dr. Josh Dines has been guest, my guest here on the World Walkout of Hotline on 97.3 ESPN. He's the leading orthopedic sports surgeon at the hospital for special surgery. Also works with the Mets and the Rangers. Dr. Dines, appreciate your time today and I encourage folks to follow you on Twitter at Josh Dines, MD. Thank you so much for having me.